Hey, everybody. I, I know a lot of people in this room. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Neil Bryant, SOC. I'm a camera Steadicam operator like most of you. A lot of this talk is going to be geared towards Steadicam operators. I'm going to sort of assume that most people here have an understanding of Steadicam, but I've also tried to make it palatable uh, to people that have no Steadicam experience. So I found the ZG in Charles Papert's garage like 10 years ago. Um, it was a prototype that he had developed basically in a time in the industry where people were coming from this long tradition of like really nicely balanced film cameras with a mag on the back and, and nice ergonomics that you could pan around to these like weird blocky big digital cinema cameras, the Genesis, things like that where they were like horrible to operate. And Charles was getting really frustrated, you know, using like easy rigs and, and worrying, you know, about the pendulum effect and trying to move with this kind of awkward thing. And he thought, well, what if I could take this handheld camera and utilize the ergonomics of my Steadicam vest and just put this same thing that's been holding this weight on my body to work for handheld? He had the prototype and I, I spotted it and he explained it to me and I, I started taking it out on jobs. And immediately what I found was that directors and DPs really loved it. Um, and I'll sort of get into why. So first think about why, if you are a Steadicam operator, why you love Steadicam and the sort of freedom of movement that you have. We're not necessarily tethered to how short we are, how tall we are, even like the geography of the room. Like, you know, I can go into low mode with a Steadicam and float out over this table. I, it's, it's an afterthought for me to be with someone low here by my knee or with someone over my head. And sort of what the ZG does is take this freedom of movement and this power we have to put the lens where it needs to be back into our hands with a handheld camera. It also gives us control over the look. It's like we can make the look as calm as we want. We can make it as aggressive as we want. And it's like a choice you can make when you're operating. So uh, I'm going to show a clip from The Last of Us. This is on ZG, running backwards, and now running forwards downstairs. And I'm pretty low here, holding this frame, booming down further, and now I'm rising up with it. <laughs> it's kind of dark here, but... So here, when he dips for cover, boom, going down with him again. And we're going to find this other guy in the background, and now we're up and running, and I can more or less keep the, the amount of shake the same throughout that shot. So um, <clears throat> having said that, the ZG is an instrument that you, uh, that you have to understand. Um, it's not something that you can just like pull out of the case and go right away. The way I sort of think about it is like, most anyone has picked up a handheld camera for the first time and been able to use it. So there, there's very little learning curve of like going handheld for the first time, but it takes years to really like finesse it and, and get where you can hide your footsteps and go up and down stairs. The ZG is sort of like reverse of that. There is an upfront learning curve you have to go through to like understand the tool and how to actually use it. But once you're through that, you've basically mastered the tool and you can, you can do uh, with it what you want. Um, one thing it's really done for me is what it's doing right here, getting the camera off of my body. Most of us have been on long, drawn out handheld shows, sometimes with very heavy cameras like this one. And the fact that I can have a handheld camera docked to a tripod or riding on a dolly um, means I can give the director and the DP consistency. You know, if I'm doing some long, like, 10-minute take, over time, my muscles are going to start to tense up and I'm going to start to break down and, the, and it's going to get shakier and shakier. What this allows us to do is, like, keep the look the same from minute one of the take to minute 10 of the take from 8 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m. at night and hopefully from Monday to Friday if you're, if you're mostly hard mounting it. So uh, I'll, I'm going to get right into how I like to build it and balance it. Uh, this is my personal ZG here, in this case. So the first thing you do is you pull the unit itself out. And there's a dock underneath. A 
Once I have the camera on here and I'm balanced, I'll raise the stand up to like a more comfortable docking height, but this is pretty good for building. Now I can throw the rig itself on here. So this just drops in. There's not a lock in place, but this fork is so deep that it's really safe. Like you'd have to basically still tilt the stand completely over for the thing to jump out. Um, once you're on there, go ahead and put your handles on. I like to use asymmetrical handles. There's a, a handle and a disc. Um, I like to use one on either side. I'll get into specifically why later. But it's a 3 16 wrench. Screw the thing in. It's worth pointing out here on the handle, there's a through channel to get your wrench through to be able to turn this bolt. There it is. OK, it's built. Nice. Going over just the basic anatomy of this thing. Um, there's a roll axis, a tilt axis, and then down here there's a pan axis. So it's a, it's a three axis system. I'm going to go ahead and lock everything off. There are these like hard plunger locks that sort of shut down whatever axis you're dealing with. It's, a, it's on a spring, so when it's depressed, it's in a locked position. And to open it, you pull it out and turn it 90 degrees, and now it's free and open. But for now, I'm going to lock the tilt and lock the roll. There are friction brakes you can use. So if you're, say, on a baby pin or on a C-stand, and you're trying to set a frame and walk away for, for lighting for the DP, um, you can set a tilt angle with this brake and hold a frame. It, because it's a friction brake, you can just overcome it. So you shouldn't rely on it for lens changes or anything like that. But it, it's something that's there, especially for, uh, for setting a frame. On the other side, the blue knob is a, like a fluid drag, sort of like what you have on a fluid head. Um, so it starts to slowly introduce fluid just into the tilt axis. This is something that's really handy in a specific niche situation where you're mounted to a stand, you're not carrying a, the camera on your body, and you're doing very long lens stuff where you need to like land very specific tilts. That's the only time you should introduce any fluid drag into the system. Any other time, especially when you're wearing it, all these axes need to be open and free to gimbal around. Sort of think about if you had friction in the gimbal of your Steadicam. Any friction in there is going to induce tilt or roll into the camera itself. So all this needs to be wide open and free, especially when you're body mounted. The camera docks into what's basically like an SOS style plate. All right, thank you. So when you first land on this thing, just go ahead and tighten this so that it's safe and it's locked and have a think about monitor placement. So I'm a regular side operator. So most of the time, I'm going to be right here with this thing. So I try to put the monitor in a place where I'm going to be able to see it most of the time. Um, so I like it off to one side and a little high. There was a while where I was putting it right over the mat box, kind of centered here. I started to get into trouble when I was booming up over my head, because then I would totally lose the monitor behind the camera. So now I just put it off to one side. I, I'm there 90% of the time. There are occasions where I'll switch over to this side, but I've still got view of the monitor. I can sort of look over the camera and see the monitor. About the only place I would get into trouble is over here. Um, so play around with it and try to think ahead of like where you might put the monitor. And it might change for different shots depending on what you're doing. Um, but we're on the ZG. We have the monitor placement. And now we can balance. So what I like to do is make sure everything's locked so the thing will behave. And then I just jump across and land on this pin. See how it's panning by itself? I'm just going to lock this pan so that it'll behave. 
So again, three axes. We're going to work with fore and aft, side to side, and then also top to bottom balance. And we're going to sort of do top to bottom and fore and aft at the same time. So I'm going to unlock the tilt and see that it's back heavy. And then I just open this lock here and scoot the plate forward a little bit. I nailed it. Lock it back up, and now I'm going to check my top to bottom. So I'm top heavy. You can see that. Camera's trying to turn over. So I have these telescoping posts. Everybody can see that? That basically controls the, uh, the top to bottom balance. So I'm going to start backing them off. And you can even see those in the front row. You should be able to see scale more uh, numbers appearing here on this scale. So it, this rod is lengthening and dropping the, the camera down. I want to basically get to a point where I'm neutral. Still a little top heavy. I want to basically get to a point where I'm neutral and then slightly bottom heavy from there. That's basically just how I like it. Like, it's almost neutral. It just has a slight top to uh, a bottom heavy bias, basically. Uh, so now I can work on my roll, lock the tilt, unlock the roll. So I'm going to move the weight uphill, throw this open, use my fingers down here to scoot the weight uphill on these rods. There we go. Test it. All right, cool. That's it. It's balanced. Usually in prep, once you've found your z-axis, your top to bottom balance, you basically never have to touch it again. You're, you're going to be working with your fore aft most of the time, and then side to side, you know, if things, get, accessories come and go, things like that. Um, so I'm going to talk next about body mounting the thing. You can undersling this thing. So normally an arm post would go in here, and you'd have, you know, body mounted range from like here to here. But you can invert the whole system and, and hang it. Um, I've not had success with this body mounted, but it's been a great uh, friend to me when I'm riding on the dolly. So I can Garfield mount to the dolly, under sling the ZG, and then we can do these, you know, I can be very comfortably hard mounted and just be like right on, on the deck with a, with, a, uh, with a handheld camera. I can boom and have all that freedom that I'm used to uh, riding the dolly. So getting in the low mode is pretty simple. What you want to do is mark your fore aft position on your plate. We're going to go ahead and pull the camera off. Thanks. And then turn this, unlock here, turn this upside down, lock it back. Make sure the roll's locked too, so this isn't banging all over the place. And then we're going to pop the camera right back in, see if we can get through. Yeah, there we go. So if you return to that same fore aft mark that you set and you put your monitor back where you had it, you're, you're in balance. You're ready to go. So for low mode, what, what I'm going to do is actually take an F bracket from a steady cam and drop it in here. Those of you familiar with steady cam, you should be able to get a sense of like, we're basically going to pick this thing up and take it over to an arm and pop it in that way. Um, this is a Tiffin F bracket. It, it works fine, but you can see my arm goes in this way and it actually kinks it out at an angle, which is a little unfortunate. So what I would recommend for ZG is actually using the straight pro style because that would keep it straight up and down for you. Body mounting. The thing to think about first off with body mounting this thing is it is a handheld camera. There's, there's been a bit of a conceptual hurdle with people thinking of like this should feel like it maybe like a gimbal or a steady cam. Um, it is very much a handheld camera. Um, and to illustrate that, I have another Last of Us clip. Our very talented DP, Ksenia Serrata, doing the back shot, now that's a ZG shot. That's a ZG shot. That's a handheld shot. That's a ZG shot. 
That's a handheld shot. So you can see these things cut together like basically interchangeably. So think of it as a handheld camera. When you're wearing this thing, arm tuning is like critical. Just like a Steadicam, you have to have a really light touch on this or you're going to influence it. So an issue I keep seeing is people with like really oversprung arms. It is a lot lighter than a sled, so you've got to be able to really dial your, uh, your tension back on your arm. And I was just day playing, so this thing should be way cranked up, actually. I'm going to go ahead and unlock everything so that it's free and it's easy for me to get in and out of here. Wow, okay, yeah, the arm's way too powerful. So <laughs> I'm going to lock it back up so that it'll behave and not jump around while I'm trying to do this and start dialing all the tension out of my arm. Oh my God. So taking everything out, because if anything, I want the arm underpowered rather than overpowered. Because if, my, if I'm ha having to like really push this thing down, my arms are gonna tighten up and all that's gonna get through to the lens. So that's great. Unlock it. Just fine tune my 4F there. Okay, great. The one thing you have to think about, you might think you want as little arm post height as possible, but there's actually gonna be a clearance issue here. You can see that how the cradle of the ZG is almost hitting the bone of my arm. So I need a little bit of post height here to work with. So I have like a minimum setting on this post, a little etch mark that I've made to make sure that I can use all the boom. I can, I can come down here, I can boom over my head, I can use the whole, the whole range of the arm. So when you first pick, thing, pick this thing up, think of the camera riding on its own little platform. Like, ignore this whole roll assembly, ignore the arm. And mentally, if you could just think about having side handles on a camera that was very finely balanced, you're basically just picking that camera up and moving it around. So you're just manipulating this camera platform. Um, and you're sort of guiding it and encouraging it to move. Once you have that sort of locked in your head, you need to think about all these other moving parts moving around the camera, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna show you these exercises that um, make me look super cool. Um, and uh, you know, I, I love doing them just because of how awesome I look. Um, you need to get used to the fore aft movement of this cradle. So take your hips and pitch them fore and aft. And get used to this movement and holding the same tilt angle. Does that make sense? Because this is what's gonna happen when I walk. And I'm, I'm keeping the, the, the tilt basically the same. The next one is encouraging this roller. So taking your hips and moving the thing side to side and getting used to what that feels like. Because when you start moving around, especially at a high speed, this thing's gonna be gimbling like crazy around the camera and you need to be able to lock in that platform and, and uh, keep it calm. One thing I forgot to mention, when you put a steady cam on your arm, the gimbal handle's coming off like this and the weight's kind of off to one side. So there's a torsional effect on this post that's sort of locking it in. With the ZG, we don't have that. We're coming straight down onto this post so that's why this little lock is here. It's there basically to grab the post and prevent chatter because it, the ZG is just going straight on. So I talked earlier about having asymmetrical grips. Here's why. With this handle, I've got quite a bit of leverage to tilt with, which is like advantageous to me if I want to tilt. But when I'm running or walking really quickly, any tension in my hand is gonna have more leverage to wiggle the tilt axis up and down. Does that make sense? So I like a disc on this side because I don't have near the leverage. It's a much smaller 
radius than the, than the handle. So when I'm moving, I mostly use this disc for tilt. And then if I want to throw a tilt or, or you know, encourage tilt in the camera, then I engage this other hand and I tilt with my left hand, I stabilize with my right hand, if that makes sense. Um, and then, you know, start to think about not necessarily being locked into one position. If I'm panning way over here, I lose that handle. I no longer have access to it. So I'm actually going to grab the battery, and I have a lot more tilt ability. I have tons of leverage now to tilt this thing. And then, you know, when, if I go to do another move, I can come right back over to this handle. Same thing. If I pan way over here, I can do this. You know, I can throw whips with the battery. So I, I try to not necessarily get locked into a rigid mode and just leave my hands kind of free to go where they need to go for the purposes of the shot. Once you kind of have these ideas down, you're really free to, like, go wherever you want to go, you know? And it makes doing, like, things that would be really tough with a camera, especially a heavy camera just in your hands, now really available to you. So here's just like walking. Stopping. So another thing you can sort of think about is when you stop with this thing, because it's taking your footsteps out of the equation like a Steadicam, you can hold a really solid lock off. For a lot of DPs and directors, it's like too solid. So when I'm stationary, I might take my hand and like encourage some movement. And especially if I'm going to break off into like a really energetic run, and I know that naturally the camera's gonna shake more, I might induce more movement before the move starts, just so I can maintain a consistent amount of float throughout the shot. Does that make sense? So sometimes you want to feel that change. Like emotionally, you want to be more static when the, when the character's static, and then when we break off into a run, you want the camera to become unhinged and crazy. Um, you can do that, or with this, you now have the choice um, to sort of keep this look, and then you start moving, and it's the same. And now, you know, just like a steady cam. It's not bothering me to work, you know, down here with kids or we've all been there, like working with an actor that's much taller than you and you want to be at eye level. And handheld is a very, like, subjective thing. Like, we tend to want to think of it as, as being very, like, observational from a person's point of view, which is great until we, you know, hang lights low in the shot and we have to think about not looking up at someone and, and being up here with them. Um, when you go into long lens territory, you have all the same stuff. You just have to use a little more finesse. You know, you have to think about how you're walking, just like a steady cam. You guys look great, by the way. And what I've found with tracking laterally is it's better for me to walk backwards. So if I'm doing like a straight track like this, I can see where I'm going, but for whatever reason, I found it easier and smoother to back up like this when I'm doing a track. So I'm doing switches. Oh God, tracking, <laughs> panning. <laughs> So that's, so that's body mounting. So now I'm going to get into hard mounting, which we already have kind of set up here. Hard mounting is really different from body mounting. When you're hard mounted to something, now you don't have your body actually introducing movement into the camera. So now we have to think of it as sort of a handheld simulator. You're adding the... the, the the energy back into the camera yourself. So again, think about using your imagination and thinking ahead of like when you could use the tool and why. 
if I'm on a long lens, parked uh, in an over, standing here for an hour, um, there's not really a reason for me to have the camera on my shoulder. I can put it on this stand and comfortably work from here. So I'm going to unlock it, do a little bit of a rebalance. OK, there we go. So now I've got all the same maneuverability. I've got basically a three-axis slider with the arm that I can push in, pull back, boom up and down. And when this is hard mounted to a dolly, it's like amazing because you can live on the dolly and ride the dolly. Or if you have a really good dolly grip, you can almost walk next to it and have him just follow your movements. He can, he can see where you're going. So if you're booming up and about to reach the limits, he can follow you with the dolly arm. You know, like I said in the beginning of the talk, I think there's a huge advantage here to getting the camera off your body when you can. If you're on a long running show with a super heavy camera, you, you can basically give the, you know, the DP and the director the look they want and keep your back alive. It, you know, if we don't have a dolly, we can just plunk this. This is a 5.8 spud. We can plunk it down onto a C stand. Um, any like chance I have to take the camera off, I will. And this isn't necessarily, like I said in the beginning, about my comfort. It's about maintaining the same consistency of fatigue so that as you're getting tired, the camera doesn't necessarily have to get shakier and shakier. Um, so what we're going to do now is show you guys a hard mount video. So that low shot, I'm on a beaver board here, wide on the trailer. You know, most of us have climbed a big ladder with a camera. You don't have to do that anymore. You know, you have 45 degrees of tilt in either direction with this thing. So it's really safe to just crank a stand up there and then climb a ladder to reach it. If you've laid dolly track and the director decides at the last minute that we'd rather this be a handheld shot, pop a baby pin on the dolly, still use the dolly track, and now you can use a long lens and, and still rely on your dolly grip to, uh, to put the lens where it needs to go. This is an example of low mode. The camera's on a jib. And so I'm just comfortably booming and keeping it alive. This is my personal favorite, walking next to the dolly with a steady cam arm. You never have to lay dance floor. So whatever the dolly grip's rolling over with the dolly, it's all going to look the same. And you have the freedom of movement to swing the camera around. This is taking the arm, mounting it to a grip tricks. And I'm adding some energy there to make it a little more uh, active. And if you don't have an arm, here's an example of us using it like a bungee rig, which works great. You can actually, if you watch the ZG itself, you can see it sort of gimbling around the camera. So you don't have any of the pendulum effect that you're used to with a bungee rig. So, I mean, this is great for like anything that you're doing with a grip tricks where you have to do like a hard start or a hard stop. Because the tilt is in neutral balance, you can just boom, stop. The, th the thing is not going to uh, pendulate at all. This is, this is interesting. Oh, this is with the prototype. Like this scene when we were over this table, we were doing this for like six hours. And yeah, I could be over that table with an easy rig, but instead I'm using the ZG to, to, to keep the weight off my body. This was a, a walk and talk we did on, uh, on Last of Us with a rickshaw. So for this, it was really important to me to like be able to do this all day and get the coverage we needed, but keep the look the same and sort of deliver them the same uh, quality of look. And for this, you know, she's a lot shorter than him. So I'm steeply looking up at him and looking down at her. And, you know, think about like walking with a handheld camera like that. Instead, I'm comfortably riding this rickshaw. The dolly grip is, is, is keeping the frame for me. And I have 
like I said, my three-dimensional slider with the arm. So if, if I need to close the over a bit more, I can pull it this way. If I need to open it up a little bit more, um, I can finesse it. So the next thing I should cover is when not to use the ZG. Um, <laughs> this thing is like not a, a do-all for handheld. This doesn't replace the handheld, the traditional handheld camera by any means. Like it's just another tool in the toolbox. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, you've got about 45 degrees of tilt in either direction, but the thing can't look straight up. It can't look straight down. Um, it, I, I personally have had a lot of trouble trying to undersling it body mounted. So if I have a low shot, I'll just pull the camera off and grab the top handle. Um, I'm also a big fan of Cinema Devices has the Ergo Rig. There's a bungee for that thing. I really like the elastomer effect and how it will dampen my footsteps a bit. I personally find that a little more forgiving than kind of the rigid cable of an easy rig. Um, the, the other thing to think of is like, be smart. Um, don't take this thing over super rough terrain or any situation you might be in where you never even take a steady cam there. It's, a, it's, it's even a little more tricky because with a steady cam, you're used to, most of the time to having a monitor down here. So you can sort of look past the monitor at where your feet are going. With this, oftentimes the monitor's up here. And you know, you, if you're doing a river crossing or something, it's best to just have a handheld camera that, God forbid, if you really ate it, it's much easier to ditch a handheld camera than this thing. I have fallen with this thing, and it's, it's, it's not very much fun, I can tell you. The, the last thing about when not to use this, you, you're using both your hands. And if you really break off into a really fast run, you know, I, I still occasionally do the odd like sprinting shot with a steady cam. I can at least take a hand off and use that hand for balance. With the ZG, both your hands are occupied and sometimes they're raised up above your chest. So it's not really possible to balance yourself in an all out run like this. So I personally would just put the camera on my shoulder uh, for a situation like that. So the big thing we've sort of run into, a question that, that's been asked is like, why do we have to use a ZG? Why not just put the camera on your shoulder? And sort of the hurdle of like pitching this to DPs and, and why you would, you would want to use it. Again, I think it's important to help people understand that it's just another tool in the toolbox that's going to allow you to put the lens in really weird positions that you, that you couldn't get to with a camera just on your shoulder. We're, we're now like arming out over tables or, or you know, booming down really low. Um, and giving again that repeatable look where we can keep the look the same. Uh, I remember on the after party, we had a handheld episode and I just thought I would pull this thing out and, and bring it out and, and show it to Carl Hersey, our DP. And I built it for, the, for this handheld sequence and I, I walk out onto the set with it for the first time and Carl's back at the monitor talking to me on comms and he asks, okay, show, why wouldn't you just put the camera on your shoulder? So we had a table about this high with a birthday cake on it and the, the cake gets destroyed in the scene so what I did was just boomed up and looked straight down on the cake and improvise like a pullback and settle into a wide shot to, to kind of set the scene. I showed him that and right away he goes, okay, I get it. I get why we'd, why we'd want this thing. I was, on 20, I was on two seasons of a 22 episode sitcom called Single Parents. And that one was interesting because they wanted the, the, the executives like came up with this look that they wanted of very long lenses, lots of camera movement, handheld, not too shaky. So uh, basically, uh, when I worked on the pilot, we had built these big um, bungee rigs where they had a, a riser coming off the dolly and like a pulley system on speed rail that was like dangling the camera. Um, and everything was on dolly. And it was very cumbersome. We couldn't really boom in the shot. So if an actor had a line in the middle of the boom, the director actually had to ask them to like hold the line and not do it while they were sitting down. Um, it was crazy. So 
when I got called to do the, pi, or the sorry, the series, um, I immediately showed the DP the ZG. Um, and he, he understood, like, we're going to have lots, of, there were stets, uh, sets with stairs. And to do that look of being on, like, a 75 or a 90 and tracking with an actor and sitting them down and having some energy to the frame but not too shaky, um, he sort of, and this was back in the prototype phase of the ZG, he sort of understood it and helped push it um, to get it on that show. Um, and, you know, that, that was good for me because I was basically able to keep my arm and vest working in a scenario where they wouldn't, they would have day played the Steadicam maybe three or four days out of the entire season. So I'm able to go to them and say, look, I can, I can give you this look. This is going to be exactly what you want. And I can keep my gear um, running on the show. Um, so, you know, like I said in the beginning, there's a little bit of learning curve with this thing. Like, I wouldn't just pull it out on set for the first time. I would definitely, like, spend a little bit of time at home, like, getting used to it um, before you bring it out on a set. Um, but there's, there's one more clip I want to show you. It looks like a pretty simple shot. Bella, she, she's got this gun, and she's running over to this backpack and hiding it. And I could do the shot handheld. I could be here and, like, boom, you know, drop back and boom. But with the ZG, I'm able to just do this and drop and keep it like the same repeatable shot, uh, take after take. The boom is so like subtle, you almost don't even notice that it happened. You know, and the, the camera drops like three feet in that, in that clip. So now we're gonna get into some shots that we did on the after party. This is uh, body mounted with Tiffany Haddish. And it's, it's a really simple shot. You know, if the look weren't handheld, we might have been doing this on a steady cam. But the fact that we can boom and just settle into a frame. And once we're there, we're, we're settling and we're, we're, we're not shaking around. This, I'm body mounted, pushing in, finding her, and then just locking in. Being able to boom, it's really nice. This is hard mounted to a dolly, so we whip and the dolly arm is actually booming me up at the end. So. Again, this is all about sort of understanding what the tool does, how it does it, and, and when and, and when not to use it. Um, in regards to body mounting it and, and why you might, you know, encourage a DP to, or, you know, or a director to allow you to keep it on a dolly, there was actually a safety bulletin that went out from the local. Um, uh, I believe it's Safety Bulletin 45 that talks about, like, extended takes and the toll that this is taking on people's bodies and nerve damage and numbness and all this. Um, so I just want to throw that out there if you're negotiating with this thing, that there is a safety bulletin about like providing operators with rigs to take some of the weight off their body. I've talked a bit about pitching this to DPs and, and sort of helping them understand why we might have this on the truck. I also like to bring the camera assistants along. Like assistants I found are, are filmmakers too. They're, you know, in a lot of ways, like them and the dolly grip are my closest ally on set. So they understand what they're looking at in the monitor. They, they know what looks good. And when you're making the day easier and shorter by using the ZG instead of, say, building an apple box staircase for you to be able to stay at the same height with a tall actor, um, you're, you're getting out of there quicker and, and you're maintaining a look. And, and I, I like to bring the assistants along with me because they're, it's just another piece of gear they're having to schlep around. So having them understand why I'm, I'm using this, I, I think, helps. And dolly grips. Like, in my experience, like, dolly grips really love this thing. I, I don't know about you guys. I know several older dolly grips with, like, ruined rotator cuffs from decades of just, like, doing this on and off operator's shoulders. So with this... Most of the time, it works just like a Steadicam. You're docking and undocking just yourself, and nobody's having to, to pull the camera on and off your shoulder. And m most dolly grips I've worked with like to work. And on handheld shows, you know, a lot of them you know, just end up like working as a spotter. With this, we can actually put the camera back on the dolly, if we're on stage, say, and the dolly grip can go back to work and move the camera. And it's, it's a lot of fun for them. So in closing, 
I just want to say, like, The Thing has been a great help to me on handheld shows. Again, it hasn't, compl- it hasn't replaced the traditional handheld camera by any means. It's just another way for me to get the shot. And what I sort of like to think about is how it can elevate the handheld camera and offer directors and DPs things that they weren't expecting. So I'm going to show uh, another clip. This is all body-mounted ZG. And these, these two characters are having an argument. And th- this is all like very traditional, you know, what you would do with a camera on your shoulder. But there are a few moments in here. Frank's about to turn around and approach the camera. And I, I got way ahead of him. I dropped back like five feet there. And you basically didn't feel it. I'm not calling attention to, to what I'm doing. I'm just like moving with the actor. There's a big counter move that occurs to, to sort of chase the eye line. And it just happens. I'm, I'm walking up over that curb there in the middle of that shot, and you don't really feel it. Um, so you're, you're more with the characters, and you're feeling the energy of the handheld camera, but you don't feel encumbered by the geography that you're having to walk over. Yeah, that's, that's my talk. Um, Thanks for uh, getting, getting through it and bearing with me. Does anybody have any questions? Dave. All right, so my first question is running. How much do you change how much you're holding? Is there a different way that you're holding it? Because it seems like when you're running, obviously, you're going to put more into it, um, into the shot. Uh, Build-wise, do you pretty much... Is it like your steady cam build is your ZG build other than maybe uh, popping a monitor on there? And that shot that you had where the camera was on the jib and you were doing it yourself, are you putting too much information into it by doing the move yourself? And would you consider having like your dolly grip sort of quote unquote do the move where you operate it? Yeah, okay. I'll sort of walk backwards in the, in the question. So. With the jib, that's interesting because when we were doing it, I was holding it kind of steady and Charles, who was directing that piece, was asking me to add more energy. So in a scenario like that, me actually gripping the camera and inducing energy into it by pulling the jib is not necessarily a bad thing. And it, you know, it's a moving target. Sometimes you, you want the camera, like I was saying earlier, to feel totally unhinged and to really you know, shake around. I, I wouldn't use the ZG in those circumstances. Like I would mainly use it to try to calm things down when I want to calm them down. So jumping over to running, I basically don't do anything different for running. Um, if you really have a sense of those exercises I was talking about, of understanding what your hips are going to do with roll and tilt, once you have a sense of that, the biggest trick you're going to have is when you are really running, your shoulders wiggle. And so, you know, if you watch, it's pretty like harmonious in the handheld errors that you see, but you do see a little bit of pan from, from just me being in like an all out run like this. But yes, in terms of build, I, I like a longer camera because it's going to um, behave a little bit more. There's a real tendency with the ZG for people to be out here. And obviously this is like murder on your back. And the whole thing about this is like trying to save your back. So try to bring it in closer. And it, it's tough when you have a battery out here on the back. But what I found is when I boom up, I can kind of tuck it in back here. Through the boom, I'll have to push it out for the battery to clear my shoulder. But once I'm down here, I can, I can pull it back in. But I, but I do like a longer camera. Any other questions? Curious to know uh, how well does it do with small spaces? Like, I know there's like a lot of stuff going around with the body. Um, so, like, how well were you able to fit in like tiny spaces? It can be both a blessing and a curse, honestly. If if you're in a really small space, and say you're you're in like a closet, and the camera has to like peek around a door, you can just stay there and like push the ZG away from you, and kind of swing it around yourself in a tight space. But if, you, if you're physically so crammed in that you're you know, just having to move, I probably would not use a ZG in those circumstances. I would just go handheld. Um, that's me. We did a shot on The Last of Us where it was like part of a dynamic, ongoing, long shot. And then at some point in the shot, we wanted a gun to fire like just off of the lens. 
and we wanted to do it practically, and we didn't want to have to digitize it or, you know, or do it with、uh, visual effects. So I can't be there. You know, we're, we're generally on wide lenses, very close to,、uh, to the actors. So it's like a safety thing. You know, I have to be like more than 30、uh, degrees off of the, the gun. So I'm operating the shot like normal. And then when we get to the part where we want to fire the gun, I grab the battery and keep the ZG there and move out of the way. A dolly grip flo- floats in a riot shield, so I'm protected. And we're able to get the, sh- you know, fire the gun. And then I go back to the camera and continue the shot. So you have to sort of think about you know, this thing no longer, the, the handheld camera no longer being tethered to you, which may or may not help you in a tight space. It's something you sort of have to think of on a case by case basis. So obviously, notice that you're using a back mounted vest. Do you see any, foresee any differences or any、uh, issues, for lack of a better word, of using it with a front mounted vest, especially when it comes to that compressing it towards you where your mount is right here? This is a great question. So I started on front mount vests. I've had a pro vest for many years, and before that, I had a 3A vest. And I ended up getting the class in just because of ZG. Because I found you know, that it, it loads you differently than a steady cam. And generally, with a steady cam, you can keep it closer to yourself, even when you're doing the best job you can with a ZG. So I've personally found the back mount more comfortable for having the camera a little further away from me than I'm used to. So I'm a big fan of the back mount vest. I wish I had picked it up years ago. Financial question Are you day renting, a l a c a r d i n g is included in your package weekly, et cetera?、So It, it sort of depends on the situation.、Um, that sitcom I was telling you about, where they wanted long lens, not too shaky, all that,、um, that what, the way that started was there was going to be no、um, steady cam rental at all. And then I would just get on a, a bump on like the day or two that the steady cam ever came out to play on that show. So, what I was able to do in that particular circumstance is show them why this was so exciting and why they wanted it on their project. And then get my steady cam rate and rental throughout the whole run of the show. So, what I did there was I said, look, just pay the steady cam rate and rental. We use the ZG. And whenever the steady, the, the steady cam came out like two days on the whole show, I'll just throw it out there because I'm gaining all this rental and hourly where I would have just been like making scale with no rental at all. So, that was a circumstance where like it really made sense for me financially. If I'm already carrying the steady cam on a show, I will just day play this as like an a la carte. Item, you know, at like 5% of cost or, or whatever.、Um, but the, you know, the way I figure it is if we're carrying steady cam, I'm already getting the, the, the rental on my gear and I'm already getting the rate. So I'll just ask for a little、um, gear bump for this thing.、Um, Dan.、Uh, I think going back quickly to the like build, basically, how you've mentioned、um, being able to go from handheld to, or when it's better to. Be just regular handheld or on the ZG or on Steadicam. What's been the quickest way? Like, at what point do you know you're going ZG and you need to tell the assistants you need that build? Yeah.、Um, I mean, ideally, you can get into sort of a mode where you're 90% there most of the way. Like,、uh, if you're doing a lot of different modes, like going Steadicam, ZG, handheld,、um, Dolly. I have a couple of different SOS plates.、Um, I believe it's jbsteadicam.com. Is that right? Yeah.、Uh, to buy SOS plates, it's an essential piece of gear I would recommend everybody to have.、Uh, so I, I would just park those SOS plates everywhere. Like have one on the、uh, assistance cart, have one living on the, the head,、um, and then I would just work off of my Steadicam plate. So, me personally, like when I go handheld, I find with my shoulder pad, the steady cam plate is comfortable enough for me to just land on that. So if I'm coming off the ZG, I, I might keep the eyepiece on for ZG. If I don't have it on there, all the assistant has to do is throw the eyepiece on.、Um, if I'm doing a lot of switching between like Ergo Rig and ZG, because I, I do love using the bungee on the Ergo Rig, there's a little attachment up here that goes on the top handle that. You feed the bungee through, I would just leave that on. So it's literally like that's the thing is like you never want to give people the impression that this is going to slow things down. Like we all know that. And that's part of getting ahead of it and knowing like when to use it and why.、Um, 
So if I, if I, God forbid, put myself in a situation where this is not the right tool, I want to be ready to jump out of it as quickly as I can. Does that make sense? I worked with a similar DP. I think it was the same guy where you had it on single parents. And I felt every time I brought up hard mounting it, I kind of got like this, Ugh. just because it takes time to bring the dolly in. They know the look that they want, but then like the point of handheld sometimes is just to be small. You're not rolling a dolly in to move a desk, you know, to get it in there. And I just, I never found like a really good way to figure out how to be like, let's just put it on the dolly, like hard mounted. You know, I always got, oh, can't you just wear it? And it's like, well, then, you know, then you break down and get tired. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Like, you know, I try to earn the DP's trust, obviously, and, and you know, do what they want me to do. Some, some DP's don't like the ZG at all, and I'll just go handheld um, when, when they want me to. Uh, with hard mounting, it's a tough one. Even when you're, I've had this uh, debate even with Steadicam. It's like, why not just wear the Steadicam? So I'm personally like a little pushy. Like I won't, I won't necessarily break the DP's trust, but if I know that there's room and I know it will work and I know the shot will be better, I will just bring the dolly in and be hard mounted to it before he, even, he or she even necessarily realizes what's happening. And, it, and if, it, if we're nailing the shot and it's looking great, I've found I'm able to like earn that trust and they're going to trust me to make that recommendation next time. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, someone told me this, I can't remember who, a great little tip is I was a mid-season replacement. The operator before me didn't have one. I knew the producer. I knew he loved gear. So I was like, let me show you. It was a studio show. Uh, one area that is really valuable is if you do poor man's process. Because you, if you have grips bouncing a car with a 2 by 4 it looks so constant. So we hard-mounted it, put it on a vest, and then you can add the slide and the bounce, and it looks so much better. And every single day we did poor man's process, that was the first thing. Yeah. And it was, it's a really, really handy tool for that. Yeah, a hundred percent. In episode four or five, I can't remember, of The Last of Us, there's a lot of truck driving stuff that we did. Um, some of it we did for real, and others we did against green screen, poor man style. And we shot the real stuff first, so with the ZG just hard mounted to the dolly, I'm able to like duplicate I'm at, you know, add bounce and shimmy and pan wiggle and all that stuff. So it's, it's great for poor man's process. You know, when we do standard hand hole on our shoulder, uh, bigger cameras tend to be, you know, more inert and they tend to like not be as high frequency. Smaller cameras tend to be more high frequency. I have noticed on Last of Us times when I, I don't know if it's a ZG shot or not, but I've noticed times when it'll feel more high frequency. And then there was one where I thought, it was regular handheld, and then in the, you know, in the thing after the credits, there was behind the scenes, and it was a ZG, maybe on a dolly or something. But I was just wondering if that's like a technique thing, if there's adjustments to the balance or anything to just get a different feel. Yeah, when you're static, you know, uh, even body mounted, you can really calm the thing down. When you're moving, like some uh, energy is just naturally going to get through from the tension in your arms. So depending on what uh, the people I'm working with are looking for, I might, I might introduce more high frequency stuff or a chunkier, you know, kind of style as opposed to like a jittery style. Um, it, it, and that's sort of what's cool about it is like, especially when you're hard mounted, you can really take control of like what the handheld feels like. So you're not necessarily dictated by the camera build or by what you're walking over. Any other questions? Hey. So when I'm doing a steady cam shot, I just assume that it's bad and I don't ask anybody. And when I'm doing a handheld shot, I'm assuming that I'm trying to, you know, make it as, as smooth as possible, knowing it'll be in there. One of the things that I've found with the ZG is I'm not quite sure how much I'm putting in there. And I'm wondering what was the learning curve? Because I'm assuming that you're at a point where you're like, I know how this is looking. Because I'm still at the point where I, I look at the assistant and he's like, I'm, or, you know, and, and I'm trying to figure that out. So does that come? I mean, like, how quickly did you get to that? It, it's tough for me to say because... Again, you know, I was, it, it was 10 years ago when I first got a hold of the prototype. And so a lot of, when I was first formulating this talk, I'd even really like think about what I was going to say because I've been with it so long, like so much of this is second nature to me. 
Um, but I, I, I would encourage, like, if you can spend some time at home, you know, working with it and sort of like when you started with Steadicam, if you can kind of go back to square one a bit and do some drills at home and play back what you're doing. Because um, I don't know about you, like when I'm doing even a Steadicam shot, I can't see like vibration or little errors until I play it back, you know, because like my head's moving around and everything, everything's moving. With ZG, it's like even more so. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say if you, if you can practice at home before you put it to work, and, and, you know, it, it's sort of an experience thing. Like, I will know if I'm in an all-out sprint, like, even just the safety aspect of it, it's, I'm going to be, like, moving so much, it's almost better for me to just pull the camera off and do it handheld and safer. Uh, Neil, I was wondering um, what's been the most challenging yet rewarding shot you got with ZG where you were like, I'm glad that I have this thing. That, that first clip that I showed where we were running at night in the fire, I, I, I really like that because, you know, we looked, we, we knew that shot was coming and we looked at it and there was a decision to like go with the ZG because when I was, when I had the camera down here and I was running like at full speed at night in the rain, it was like sort of hard to see what was happening. Uh, the camera was so shaky. So with the ZG, I was able to like just calm it down enough that in all that chaos, you could tell what was happening and, you know, it allowed me to boom. That's the one that, like, first comes to mind. The fact that I, like, always have it in my back pocket, if something really dynamic and really difficult is thrown at me like that, it's, it's been a great, like, bailout thing to have on a, on a handheld show. Anybody else? Hi, um, I have a question. So have you been in any scenario where it feels like it's a, a really close choice between the ZG and the Steadicam? Or maybe like if you're in a hard mount scenario, you feel like you get a really like similar look between the two. How do you kind of decide what, when is the, the right time to use which tool? For me, like sort of the way I, how do I say this without sounding like a egomaniac? I like to fool people as much as I can with my, I want my Steadicam shot to look like a dolly. I want other operators at home to not know that it was done with a Steadicam. Like, I'll obviously fall short of that goal all the time, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the people that I'm working with to think of the Steadicam like they would think of studio mode. I like, I like them to be one and the same in terms of like how we're, how we're communicating about the, the workflow. With ZG, I want them to think about it exactly like they would think about the handheld camera. So when you sort of boil it down that way, it's like, the tools don't really overlap that much. And it's like, if we want this to feel handheld, it'll be ZG or handheld. But if we, if we and, and, and sort of like I said in the beginning, some people that aren't camera operators will look at this and think it's going to look like a Ronin or a Steadicam or something, that the final look will be very slick. And it's like, no, this is not a stabilizer. Like it is a very shaky handheld uh, look. Does that, does that answer your question? Sort of. It's sort of a case by, you know, you have to sort of think about what the director and the DP are asking of you. And if they're leaving it open to you, that's, that's a lot of responsibility and really cool that you have that trust. You know, so I, I would just think about how I want the scene to feel and do, do I want the energy of handheld or do I really want to calm it down with a steady cam? What I always wonder, what are the limits of operating through the monitor? especially in exteriors, and booming down, booming up, tilting left, right? Like I said, when you're building the thing, you really want to think about making sure wherever it goes in the shot that you're going to be able to see the monitor. And that there's a ton of like great daylight viewable onboard monitors these days um, that, are, that are not big and heavy, that can ride right on the camera and you can still see in daylight. Um, so I would have a talk with the camera assistants and make sure whatever onboard monitor they're putting on the camera, that it is a daylight viewable monitor. Um, so you're not having to worry about that. Does, does that make sense? Related to that, would you ever do maybe a dual monitor situation if the situation calls for it? Like maybe a, a five inch on one side? That, it's interesting you say that. Um, could, you're sort of reminding me of times I've forgotten. I've never put on two monitors, but I have flipped this thing out, you know, and been over here in the, in, the, in the main monitor and then panning over here or during a, during a boom, like handing off from one to the other. So yeah, that can, be, that can be great. I mean, obviously we're not wanting to add weight wherever we can avoid it, but 
If the shot calls for it, sure. And it's sort of to your question, it's like seeing what needs to happen in the shot and, and thinking ahead and, and making sure you're ready for it. So any other questions? Could you address the issue of arm options, if there are any arm options, please? Yeah, it should work with any arm. It, it uses a 5 8 um, receiver, so like a pro arm. So with my Tiffin arm, I have to use like a little step-down adapter uh, to make it work. I know people are loving the NB stabilizer. Like, uh, people love that thing because it can go down so to such a small payload. This is a lot lighter than a Steadicam, so you may have trouble if you have a four canister, you know, the Titan, you know, dialing all that the way down. So, but you can basically use any, any arm with it. Are you able to market yourself if you're working on a show that's not going to pay for Steadicam? Are you going to get more out of them as opposed to just being a standard operator rate? Yes. So I have on more than one occasion used this. I don't want to make it sound like I'm totally financially motivated, but I've been able to get the same rate and rental that I would get with a Steadicam to do this. And I think if you are doing this, you should, because you're putting the same load on your body with the, the Steadicam vest that you would with a sled. Again, again, I go back to single parents because that was such a weird, it was such like a weirdly specific handheld show. They wanted handheld, not too shaky, very, you know, on like a 70 millimeter lens. So with that, I'm able to show them what it can do and like everybody is on board, like the executive producer is on board immediately. And, and that sort of helps like justify why they're gonna pay all this money for your, for your rate and rental. Some people don't understand and, they, and, and it's not that show and they want you to just be a small, nimble handheld camera. I try to get the DP on my side and understand, I, I want the DP to understand the tool understand why we're going to need it and then they can hopefully bring the director and production along along with us in this discussion i hope